Do you take the ball or do you play defense on the first coin snap? <laughs> we win it, Coach. We won it. What do you do? We won the talk. Okay. Well, first of all, Vershawn, I would just like to say, after listening to your opening, um, <clears throat> we uh, we should have let you, at least at halftime, be a cheerleader. Um, <clears throat> I have never seen this much enthusiasm from this guy. And in five years, I didn't see that. But um, we anyway, never saw that at practice, didn't no. we, Coach? <laughs> no, I am. Um, I suppose in most cases you, you defer because uh, by the second half, you've had a better chance to analyze what the other team, how they're going to line up. Because uh, in, in the first first series, you have no idea. <laughs> There's some games where we'd practice all week against the 5 2 defense. And I remember one time we went down to Kansas, and there was 11 guys lined up within two yards of the line of scrimmage. They said, we're going to stop the run, and we don't care what you do. And, uh, and it got a little rough, and we <laughs> we completed four straight passes, which we'd never done in my whole lifetime. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and all of a sudden, they backed out of it, and I was so relieved because uh, if they stayed with it, they had a better chance. But uh, we, were, we were kind of scratching our heads there for a little bit. But second half, you can probably be more realistic uh, and and have a little better opportunity with what you're going to do with the football with that particular possession because you're you don't have as many surprises. Trevor, I want to go back to the question about conference expansion a little bit. You made some news on Sports Nightly last night. Um, in terms of what is going to happen in the future, um, how important is it to win games? You mentioned APR as well. Important to have good academics so we can make sure Nebraska stays in the Big Ten or wherever the next big time conference is. Well, and first of all, I have to be very careful. I, I don't want people to think that I'm, you know, out trying to lead the charge of all this change. That, that, that's not the reality. The reality is all of this is happening to us. And uh, I just feel like it's rather than spending any energy or time lamenting things that we all wish were different. The reality is we got to get busy defining where we're ultimately going to land and make sure we have a strategy, given that new reality, that we can be successful. I want to say, first and foremost, um, there's one person, and, I, and I'm not just, there's one person that is responsible for the reason why we're in the Big Ten right now, and that's Tom Osborne. Uh, we did not get in the Big Ten because of media market. We didn't get into the Big Ten because number of alumni. We got into the Big Ten because of historical success. And I always remind myself, everything that we as an administration and coaches today have the privilege and blessing of being able to be a part of as part of the quote haves is a result of his 25 years of coaching and people need to never forget that if it wasn't for tom osborne's coaching career the picture for nebraska athlete athletics could look very very different right now that's a fact and then i thought to myself what's the best way we could honor that number one we can honor it with how we play the game now under coach rule right and number two for everybody in this room i know he's going to get mad at me but if you really want to honor it, make a donation to teammates that's how you, his 255 wins that put Nebraska in the Big Ten Conference, which allowed us to even have these types of conversations. So, you know, I, I, I got to be a little bit careful. I, 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 I'm not trying to, I'm trying to create a sense of urgency, to be real honest with you, because I do believe that, um, and, and I, I can sense where things are going. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I do believe that, um, Across the board, uh, the changes that are going to happen are, are going to be real. And data and analytics has changed the game in so many different ways. Like, you know, the Big Ten Network and the, 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 you know, the folks who are part of the Big Ten, that was all part of developing a strategy around the cable bundle, you know. And as that continues to fall apart and we go to a streaming model, um, you know, we, we all think that the conference itself, if you're in one or two conferences, well, you're good. Is that a guarantee? We've never done it yet, but at what point down the line, if resources become scarce, does everybody have the protection of being in a conference? And if the conference itself continues to look differently, as Coach said, and it becomes a bigger 
then maybe the conference doesn't give you. So I don't want a false sense of security that we're, we're in the Big Ten, so we're good. Um, we've got a, we got work to do. And I think it's going to be more than just the success of the football team. Uh, I think it's the strength of your overall brand as an institution. I think your academic profile. I think all that stuff's going to matter. And uh, during times like this, this is why I'm bullish on Nebraska, because we, if you care about Nebraska and you love Nebraska, put all your personal agendas aside. We come together uh, to ensure that we're going to be successful long term. So I don't know where it's all going. I just uh, I believe that, you know, we can't we can't for the next five, six, seven years, um, you know, just be comfortable with where we are. And uh, I think that's that's kind of my perspective. I was going to ask you a question, Trev, about expansion, but I got I got to piggyback what you said. Coach Osborne, how's the teammates mentoring program going? And are the numbers doing well? And what do we need to do to help out? Okay, I, I didn't come up here for a commercial for teammates. I know that's not why you're here today. Um, the reason we started teammates was that um, over uh, 36 years of coaching, I saw a lot of changes. And the number one change that I saw was changes in the family structure. And um, when I first started recruiting back in 1962, very seldom did we run across a young man we were recruiting. It wasn't living under the same roof, but both biological parents. As time went on, that changed. We'd have to go to one town to see the dad, another town to see the mom. And sometimes there was no dad, and sometimes there was, not, there was neither. And so the family structure changed. And I was spending more and more time with individual issues and personal baggage than it was with X's and O's. And so back in 1991, I just got in front of our team one day and I said, how many guys would be willing to serve as a mentor to some middle school kids here in Lincoln? And uh, 22 hands went up, so we matched them up had no idea what we were doing, just said meet him once a week. And after a, a few years, that all played itself out. And of those 22, uh, 21 graduated on time, the other one a year later. But we got some money together and 18 of the 22 went to college. And from that population, we thought maybe four or five, if we got four or five to go to college, that'd be really good. So we thought, well, there's something to it. So we expanded across Nebraska we're now in five states. We mentor about 10,000 kids. And um, and so the graduation was last year with 98% of those kids. And uh, when you figure that most of them are free and reduced lunch and most of them are single parent families, you'd normally think graduation be 70, 75%. So uh, every young person who doesn't graduate from high school will on average cost society $300,000 in their lifetime. That's unemployment, aided dependent children, sometimes incarceration, substance abuse, and so on. And so if you figure you maybe graduated 150 kids that would not have graduated, and multiply that by 300,000, you're talking well into the 30 million range. So it is cost effective and it does make a difference. So anyway, that's where we are and that's what we do. But um, as far as conference realignment, I just wanted to mention this. Some uh, Trev was very gracious. He said that my getting us into the Big Ten, that I was the guy that was responsible. And I kind of winced a little bit because I'm sure there's a few of you still are not real happy with that move. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> by way of exclamation, I've, I've said this several times, so I hope you uh, I'm not uh, – repeating myself too much. But we really were kind of uh, between a rock and a hard place because we, uh, we realized that the Southern Division, they didn't tell us anything about this, but they were negotiating with the Pac-12, which now appears to be non-existent, and they were going to join with the Pac-12. And then the thing that broke the deal was Texas would not give up the Longhorn Network. And the Pac-12 said, we need all television revenue. And, uh, and so that was, bro broke it. But we left because we knew Missouri was trying to leave. We knew Colorado was trying to leave. And it looked like we weren't going to have a Southern Division. That was going to leave Kansas, Kansas State, Nebraska, and maybe Iowa State uh, out on a limb. And so uh, 
we did we did negotiate with the Big Ten, and uh, it does give us some stability. But um, so anyway, that's why it happened, and um, so um, <laughs> whether whether it's better or worse, I, I think probably in the long run it's worked out fairly well in that in that regard. Give it up to coach on teammates what he's done. I mean, still contributing. Give it up for that. It's pretty amazing. And and don't blame him for leaving the Big Twelve either. Don't do that. That wouldn't be good. Uh, let's let's get to NIL a little bit because we are in a situation now where it might come under you know, federal legislation eventually. Um, I hate using the word fair, but how do we make it fair for everyone? Fair for the student athlete. Fair for the university. Fair for the people that are donating. How do we how do we make NIL fair? Well, it's a great question. You know, we 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 consistently are told uh, at the conference level, you know, to we we, we can't. We can't collude. Uh, there's, you know, all kinds of legal challenges. We need a federal solution. We need an antitrust exemption. We need Congress involved. As you all know, getting Congress to agree on anything is somewhat challenging today. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm actually uh, um, the uh, NCAA asked me. I'm going to. I'm on a committee. Um, I'm on a lot of committees, by the way. But uh, we, we're actually working on at the at the uh, central office on institutional involvement. And I think what. Um, not in an effort to eliminate NIL, not in, a, in an effort to even eliminate collectives. That's not the point. The point is, it's a really uncomfortable position to be accountable to the integrity of the brand and have no control. We have spent years in the NCAA talking about institutional control and reputational risk. Well, we're right back to it. Uh, and I am grateful uh, to 1890, to the collect, to all, anybody here who supported us through NIL. I promise, uh, this, it's, it's, I'm grateful for it. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, collectives are booster clubs. And so we, we need to have institutional, we need to be allowed to have institutional involvement in the application and execution of NIL. And without it, um, it's, it's just challenging. You know, it's, it's really hard. So I think we'll, um, uh, I, I've been impressed with Charlie Baker. Um, and by the way, if some of you guys have some ideas about NIL, come to the volleyball Day in Nebraska event, he's going to be here. You come down in the field and you give him a, a few uh, uh, words of wisdom. But he, uh, I, I've been impressed with him. He, he is, uh, um, he's working hard on it. He's doing the right things. He's eliminating some of the bureaucratic steps that are part of the NCAA. He's got the hardest job in the world. Uh, but, we're, but, but we're trying. It's just, it's just very difficult. We, we had a chance several years ago to address this, and um, we chose not to. Trevor, it seems like uh, every other month there's more teams getting into the Big Ten. Are there any plans? <laughs> are there any plans to get Texas, a Texas school, into the Big Ten? Well, we're not going to break any any uh, news here, Vershawn. But um, no, you know, I mean, and Coach mentioned it. You know, uh, money is driving. You know, brand values, all the things that. Gosh, you know, we got into this because we love the purity of college football. We love Nebraska. We love young people coming together to create a team. At the end of the day, you know, um, when you look at resources, and obviously resources haven't guaranteed us success, but they guarantee an opportunity. And it's not just football. It's the rest of your programs. So, you know, you, you could go out and invite a whole bunch of people into your conference. But are you willing, Vershawn, if they say, okay, we're going to have all these people come in, but we're now, we're, we were giving you $100, but now we're only going to give you 50 because we're going to subsidize the other schools. Nobody's going to vote for that. So that's where individual brand value of institutions is so critically important. And uh, in the model we're currently in, right, it's kind of like that cable bundle model. Every brand is getting the same amount. Michigan is receiving the same distribution as Nebraska, as Maryland, as Illinois. And at some point, you know, we have not gotten there, but that's the concern is if you individualize the brand value, do you go down the path of some schools make this, some schools make that? And um, so, so that's, that's, that's why when you make decisions about, um, you know, I expansion in college, the overall brand value to the networks really in large part is driving what that, what that uh, alignment and uh, expansion looks like. And you brought it up earlier. I mean, you bring in a Rutgers in Maryland because that's D.C. and allegedly New York. In Nebraska, obviously, it's a very small market. I believe we're 75th in Omaha. It's a TV market. It's really a testament to what Coach Osborne, but also the fans, right? The eyeballs, 
getting online, talking about Nebraska, that's what really makes this brand as valuable as it is. We need Husker Nation now more than ever before. If you know there's a Nebraska game on TV, first of all, we'd like you to come if it's at home. Um, but if not, please turn on your TV, whatever, however you get it, um, because it matters. Things like Volleyball Day in Nebraska, while that wasn't the intent, this really, really matters. Um, so, you know, the, the success that Coach Osborne, the consistency of the, of the football program and, and the Husker Nation, which is all across, you know, the country. And then I think there were other people that weren't from Nebraska, didn't graduate, but they just, the, the Husker brand, our helmet, the, just the cleanliness, you know, it resonated with people. Well, in people, Oklahoma, people, Thanksgiving. That's people exactly that. right. So Nebraska took risk. Like we were one of the first schools to play those types of games. And so um, I, I think that'll all become very, very important and, and uh, in the long term. Yeah. Coach Osborne, it's me again. And I got I to gotta ask this because I used to bring the plays in, right? It used to tell me what the play was and I'll go. Yeah, I didn't get it wrong too many times. Sometimes did I? you forgot. I did. Had... I did. So it's the, it's we 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 they elected they we lost the toss they said give us the ball, give me what's your first play call and why. <laughs> Jogging that memory. Yeah, we got the ball now, right? We got the ball. Okay. Well, I uh, depends a little bit on who your quarterback is, what your personnel is, what you do well, and uh, my guess is that I'd probably line up and run the football first. <laughs> And uh, the first down's a big down because if you can make five, six yards on first down, it makes things so much easier as a play caller. If on first down you throw a pass and it's incomplete, then things get a little bit dicey because the defense uh, begins to have the edge because they kind of know what you're going to have. This is Lincoln's home for sports talk on the FM dial. The home of Kansas City Royals baseball. KNTK FM first, 93.7 the ticket. We often led the uh, conference in touchdown passes, which might shock you. But the reason we did that was that we had a really good running game. And so people would begin to have to distort their secondary. They'd have to get their safeties involved to stop the running game. And that opens up a lot of things in play action passes. So we'd run the ball, run the ball, get three or four first downs, and pretty soon we'd hit them with a pass. And quite often it was pretty destructive to that defense. So um, I'd probably line up and run it. And I'd say one other thing is that um, each conference sometimes has a little bit of a personality. And one thing that was different than the Big 12 is the Big Ten tends to be more of a ball control conference. And so you got to make sure that you have the ball as much or more than that opponent. Over the years, we probably averaged uh, 10 snaps, 15 snaps uh, on offense more than, than the other team. And that's the best defense you can have because if you got the ball, the defense isn't out there on the field. And so uh, we tried to play the game in such a way that uh, at the end of three quarters, we're the strongest team. And if the other team didn't want to play very much anymore. And so uh, we usually were the best team in the fourth quarter. And, uh, and that's kind of a contest of wills. And one thing that you'll see from Minnesota, they'll run the ball and they won't necessarily give up on it. I don't have Ibrahim anymore, which will help a little bit. And uh, but they'll they'll test you as far as bar as far as ball control, and so uh, I, I, Matt Matt's aware of that, and I think he'll uh, he'll do a good job. We have some some good running backs, and um, I think they'll be good. Hope the offensive line will be good, and uh, so uh, we'll see. But it really helps if you can establish a running game because then if you want to throw the ball. You, you really can damage people. You don't have to throw it as much, but when you do, it, it really counts. So I would run the ball. That's a long answer. <laughs> it's a good call. It's a good call. Trev, so much changed in college football over the last 10 years. You had almost like a, a fight to have the, the biggest stadium, the most attendance. Now it's about being comfortable for the people that are sitting there and having Wi-Fi and, and wider seats. Can you kind of give us an 
an idea of what Memorial Stadium will look like in 10, 15 years? What, what are you hoping for it to look like? Well, you know, it's like, I think at Nebraska, there's, it, it's just a standard, right? Like, you know, instead of saying, well, we're going to be great in athletics, but we don't care about academics. We, we, we have a standard that we're going to try to be great at everything. And if, if that's kind of our culture and standard where, you know, and I'm so proud of our student athletes across the board, you know, not just as athletes, but what we do in the classroom, what they do in the community. We look at the stadium. I mean, I think the stadium's great. There's areas of it that are wonderful. Uh, when coach was here, they did a great project on the east side. That's just fantastic. But I think, you know, Memorial Stadium needs to be the best college football experience in the country, period. And more of, you know, it's not just about the seat itself. And so we did the survey. That's informing all of our values. Um, you know, the stadium itself is very, very important. I got to be a little careful how far I go here, but we want to connect all of the deal. So we want to have a concourse so you can go all the way around the stadium. Um, we'd like to, you know, we got to fix South Stadium, but we want to affect every single deal, right? East, West, South, North. Uh, North Stadium really doesn't allow for, you know, the the tread depth doesn't allow for chairbacks. The, the the fire marshal wouldn't, uh, you know, approve that. So so those are going to have to be bench seating. Um, but we need to do a better job, make it more intuitive for our fans. We've got like 13 different, you know, entrance points in terms of seat licensing fees. You know, if we could get that down to five or six, Michael, um, you know, have a bunch of seats that don't require any seat licensing. That's one of the things that we learned. There's a lot of people that feel like experiencing Husker football is outside of their economic capability. That, that can't be the case. Um, we did a lot of research and, you know, uh, b between seat licensing fees and ticket costs, we're the fifth most expensive ticket in college football. And that's not right, especially when you're three and nine. So, um, We've we've got some solutions. Uh, we need to rethink a lot of things. Uh, I don't want to announce a bunch of stuff because you might get really mad at me. But you know, we, this is going to be very disruptive. We have to do this. This is some difficult things we're going to have to do. Everybody's going to be affected. But in the end, I think it's going to be really important because what I'm really, I'm, obviously, I'm focused about the fan experience. We compete against the 80 inch TV every day. And if your experience, if what you experience at Memorial Stadium doesn't supersede what you can get in your basement. And we got a problem, right? So we've got to make sure it's special. We have to have room around the stadium for families. You know, we put Go Big in there. We kind of lost some of the space that young kids would go play with the football. And so we've got to rethink that. Um, we're going to rethink, you know, integration with our campus on the academic side. We went to Notre Dame and studied how they had integrated some of that. Uh, I will tell you from a business perspective, you know, we spent a day with the Cubs and uh, watched what the Ricketts family had done with Wrigleyville and sort of taken this iconic stadium and transitioning it and uh, they didn't just dramatically raise ticket prices but they tripled their revenue and part of that was by dramatically increasing point of sale just very fundamental things uh, that we can do within the stadium i don't know where the future is i know this is going to shock you but you know if we ever end up getting into a situation where we're collectively bargaining that's probably not been brought up a lot in college athletics but if that ever happened down the road, uh, players have rights to revenues that happen inside the stadium. Why does NFL teams like the Bears, why will they move from downtown to Arlington, Illinois, buy a bunch of land because they'll develop around their stadium and they'll create new revenue streams and they have 100% of that. They don't get to, they have to share revenues with the players inside the stadium. So you're starting to see some of that happening across college athletics. We'll probably look beyond the stadium. Uh, at some development opportunities. We, we have to find new entrepreneurial revenue streams. As I think about the future, I think about if, if, if it's not aggregated total in terms of your media rights and it's individualized, uh, let's say there could be a reduction for us. And then if an increasing amount of dollars we're currently using to aggregate, to pay for all of our expenses goes directly to players, how are we going to replace it? That's, that's the goal. That's the job because it's going to happen. It's been slowly happening. When I played, Rashawn and I, we got a scholarship and it was the coolest thing in the world that they paid for me to go to college. That's it. I didn't have to pay any of my school. And then after we all left, they got cost of attendance and now it's 5980. So each student athlete, and we've chosen to do it for all equivalent and headcount sports and walk ons. Every student athlete at the University of Nebraska, male or female. As long as they meet basic requirements and academic progress and graduation, 
they get $5,980 of cash a year. So you can imagine, little by little, we are you know, slowly deteriorating our revenue sources and it's going directly to players. And th this is being dictated to us through the courts. This is not college athletics deciding this. This is Judge Wilkin in the Northern District of California declaring you will do this, all right? So we believe that that's gonna continue until there's a federal in, you know, intervention. So what I'm trying to prepare for is, I don't know the number, whether it's 5 million, 10 or $40 million annually that gets redistributed, how do we react? We can't just raise ticket prices. We've got to find new entrepreneurial ways to replace it. And this is where I'm bullish and I'm confident because we have all of you. We're the best fan base in the country. And because of Coach Osborne and his football success for 25 years, this is the only athletic department in the Big Ten Conference that currently has no debt. And you should be very proud of that. So, um, you know, and, and now we, I'm going to be fully transparent. We are going to have some debt on the Go Big project. So, uh, but we have an 18 month repayment because I don't like debt. And, um, and then we'll probably have a little bit more as we work on the stadium. But the point is this, some of our colleagues, um, you know, I think about all this kind of stuff. We, you know, it's a benefit to us that we don't have as many sports. We've got about 590 student athletes. Ohio State and Michigan have over 1,000. Right, So the cost of that is really significant annually. You think about the debt. Many of my peers in the Big Ten, they start every fiscal year $25 million in the hole of debt service. They're starting. And so when you remember when we went through COVID, there were certain athletic departments that were taking out loans to get through operations. So this is where, as this all changes, while it's scary in a way, um, if we stick together with our fan base and Coach Rule continues to make progress in the rest of our sports, I really believe we can emerge out of this. If the healthiest balance sheet wins, I like our chances. We may not have mountains and a lot of rivers and you know uh, lakes here, uh, but we'll 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 be able to navigate through from a resource perspective with a strong strategic vision for the future. And uh, again, I. I'm not trying to, if it wasn't for Coach Osborne uh, and uh, the success he had for all of those years and building up our fan base, building up the viewership nationally, this would look a lot different. So now, now Trev, real quick, heading into this new era of, of Coach Rule, how important, impactful has Coach Osborne been in mentoring you in the, through this situation? It, not at all. It's just been terrible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I haven't taught him anything, Rashawn. Uh, I tell you, one guy up here, I haven't taught anything, and that's Rashawn. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I've, uh, I've always appreciated Coach Osborne. He was always really good to me, and and um, of course, I respect him immensely. And I, you know, what what I uh, mostly took away. Uh, from my time with him and is uh, work ethic. Um, you know, a lot of people, um, Coach Osborne worked harder than other coaches. That's just a fact. He, he was willing to pay a bigger price. And he created a culture where he asked us players to pay a bigger price than the other players. And that was just part of it. So I learned about work ethic and integrity and doing the right thing for the right reason, even if it was hard. And so I've just tried to, you know, Take that along. I'm I'm about half as smart as him, uh, but he um, he's just a he's just a, he's a great friend, a great mentor, and uh, I'm grateful for him. Coach, give us your best Vashon story when he was a player. Give us your best Vashon really? story from when he when when he, he was a got player. about ten of them in the clip. Well, I just remember the drop against Kansas. But yeah, give me another. Yeah. When it wasn't Kansas. <laughs> It wasn't Kansas. He was Guess always Kansas. upset that we didn't throw him the ball. And the reason we didn't throw him the ball is because we had this thing called practice. And we used to see him in practice. So finally we threw him the ball, and he dropped it. And uh, But he could block. And so uh, he fit into our style of offense very well. <laughs> and um, But I was like, Vershawn was a very positive guy. Good influence on our team. He's a co-captain, and uh, you tell from his theatrics here early on. You know he could rile people up, and um, so we really appreciated Rajon very much. 
And uh, just let me uh, say this, that, uh, you know, I, I was AD for a while. And the landscape has really shifted dramatically in college athletics. And I think Trev is doing a really a good job of trying to anticipate the things that you have to do. And I kind of remember back to the old College Football Association. You may not even remember that. But we had an association of the major college football playing schools. And that was when Georgia and Oklahoma sued the NCAA to get rights to football revenues. Because at one time, the NCAA was taking a lot of that money. And so uh, the courts awarded that to uh, the schools. And so football is not something that can be appropriated by the NCAA. And so I'm kind of thinking back to uh, maybe the schools should get together, the major schools that have major football programs and major revenue sources should be able to get together and establish some guidelines. The transfer portal is brutal right now. And, I, and I'm, I'm all for players being able to transfer but I don't know that it's a good idea that they can transfer immediately with impunity and, and all of a sudden uh, play one month for one team and another month for another. Because right now you could lose four or five of your best players in a blink and all of a sudden you're no longer the same football team. And you can get well real quick or you can go down real quick. Michigan State's an example of that. They were 10 and 2 or something like that. And then they had a losing season. And I think a lot of it was transfer portal. And so um, we've got to get some guidelines to, to, to inject some, some note of stability into the thing. And I don't know exactly uh, what it's going to look like. Having, having been in Congress for six years, I'm a little leery of turning it over to Congress because very quickly it can become politicized. And all of a sudden you got one side over here and one side over here and they uh, can't get along. Now you got Tuberville and also a, a Democrat. Tuberville's a Republican. Manchin. And they do have a joint bill. And it does look like it makes some sense. Now whether they can get people to agree or not, I don't know. But something has to happen to in inject some, some note of stability and and, uh, and I'm, I'm pleased that Trev is is thinking about all these things because if you think about where it's going to go with players and uh, all the all the expenses down the road it's it can be kind of a scary situation let's let folks ask some questions I'm sure you guys have some questions raise your hand and we'll uh Bashano roll over there and uh or we'll get right in the back there in the back I'm coming I'm coming Still moves pretty good. Look at him. Breaking tackles. Uh, right right now, we still have an 85 scholarship limit for football, right? Yeah. What if, say, 10 guys on NIL have so much money, they can turn themselves in as walk-ons? Would you then go get 10 more scholarship quality, end up with, say, 95 scholarship quality players? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would say the 85 scholarship limit across college football is really, you know, just a number now. Um, to your point, you could easily have essentially an unlimited scholarship number based on NIL deals. And I, I, you know, I don't have data to support it, you know, per se, but I think there are plenty of schools uh, that have, you know, quote more than 85 scholarship players by having walk-ons on NIL deals. That, that's why, frankly. Um, and, and part of our challenge was we had a, we had a Title IX challenge in the athletic department, okay? So and that's a federal mandate at, that we need to adhere to. Part of what our challenge is is the undergraduate population at, at UNL continues to shift. It used to be we had more males than females, and today we have significantly more females than males. So our athletic department participation is supposed to, you know, mirror what your undergraduate population is. And so what we promised our coaches was if you work with us through roster management to solve our Title IX problem, um, not only were we going to slowly you know, reduce the total number of, of student athletes, but then we'd have the resources to backfill on the 5980. 
So part of one of the way of us, you know, competing against that is we have all of our coaches in every sport, uh, including football, they have five thousand nine hundred eighty dollars essentially, you know, uh, for walk ons that it is a cash component. Plus, they all get laptops. They have a seventy five hundred postgraduate scholarship, unlimited meals at the training table and all the Adidas stuff they could ever imagine wearing. So <laughs> we're trying to create the package that basically answers to some of that. Uh, my, my question goes to fan expectations, and of course, everybody in this room is excited for the season, and I think Coach Rule's done a great job of, you know, the one day at a time uh, kind of argument, but if we win the first two games, then three games, then four games, you, you know, I could see expectations spinning out of control, and, and likewise, on the downside, if we come out flat and we lose two games, do you have, like, a plan to, like, how to try to manage the fans so that we don't get so out of control? <laughs> You know, I, I tell you what, by the way, that is a great question. And I, I have tried to think of everything. I, I can honestly tell you, I did not think of that. Um, but I, I, I did talk to Coach Rule about, you know, um, trying to manage, you know, he, he, he is obviously excited. Everybody's excited. Everybody wants to win so bad, you know. But at the end of the day for us, you know, is just remaining disciplined around forgetting about winning. Like we're at a point in our history as a program, we need to go all, I remember coach Osborne telling a story about John Wooden and, you know, having guys learn how to put their socks on right and to tie their shoes appropriately. Like that's kind of where I view us as a program right now. Um, you know, we get clouded sometimes because of the previous success, but we're literally starting over on trying to help, you know, our program understand what does discipline look like? You know, what is fun, you know, what, and, um, and what does physicality look like? And, you know, what, what I've really appreciated is, you know, Matt's willingness. And the reason why he took the job, well, not me, he, he said, it's been done here before. Like, you know, I'm not saying it's easy, but Nebraska's won championships. So there is a formula to get there. And he's been very receptive to listening to Coach Osborne. Why did you do what you did? And of course, he's doing things differently than Coach. And he's reached out to Frank Solich. He's talked to Bo Pelini, like trying to learn what works here, what doesn't work here. And part of this is all of fall camp, every one of our players, doesn't matter if you were a freshman, fifth team, or a starter, they all got 70 to 80 reps every practice. And part of that, that's development, right? And uh, getting back to some of those just fundamental detail things, we got to do that first. Um, do we really want to get to a bowl game this year? Yes. Cause I really want the band to get to go travel to a bowl game because it's important to them. And so that's where we are. A couple more. Uh, Trev question for you. Um, where is the big 10 at in terms of redoing the schedules for next year? And if, and when we're, will we go to 10 games? Yeah, we're not going to go to 10 games, at least uh, initially. You know, what, what we're all just sort of trying to figure out is what is the new college football playoff going to look like? So we had, uh, you know, I, I serve on the football oversight committee. And so this morning at seven, we had a, a meeting with the head football coaches and commissioner. And, um, you know, that's the next order of business is, uh, you know, and strategically, as you think about the Big Ten and adding numbers, the strength of, of, of voice relative to, um, you know, the college football playoff will be important. So. You know, a long time ago when the college football playoff started, when Jim Delaney was the commissioner, the Big Ten was told strength of schedule is going to matter. And what we ultimately found out is that strength of schedule really didn't matter that much. It did not factor in the way people thought because other schools were playing FCS schools, played fewer conference games. There was a reason the Big Ten went to nine games. They thought, well, gosh, we need strength of schedule, which is going to help us get more teams in. So we got to clearly define what, you know, what that, selection process is going to look like and we'd like to have some influence into that and in that thinking uh, but i you know it took nine months to get our previous schedule um, we talked this morning we don't think uh it's going to take that long because we we have the core principles done and uh, i think there'll be some slight alterations and now the question is do we release two years or five years because at the end of the day and i'm a proponent of releasing more because at the end of the day, when you have 18 teams and nine conference games, you're gonna have, you can't look at these schedules in a silo of this is so unfair. They're out to get Nebraska. I just want to assure you, they're not out to get us. Okay, um, but one year might look different, and then year three, um, our crossover games are a lot different. So if you know if you're not transparent about the length of those and seeing how it all evens out, 
it becomes problematic. On the other hand, if we release five years and then we find out that the, the, you know, the college football playoff rationale changes, we want to have some ability and nimbleness to be able to adapt and adjust to it. So it's part of the reason why I think the SEC stayed at eight games until there's clear definition about what helps you get in the college football playoff. What they had been doing was working. And if they didn't get any more money from ESPN by playing an extra conference game, stay at eight, create as much ability to, for, as you can uh, to create a great schedule to get into the college football playoff. So I don't know if I answered your question there, but yeah. Coach, you were on the committee. What, what do you think should be the, the most important thing? What, are you, what would you look for to pick those teams? Now, if it's not necessarily strength of schedule or strength of record. Well, yeah, I was on the uh, selection committee for two years. First two years, and um, I think it's kind of interesting. We had um, a huge amount of uh, statistical data, and the thing that I finally figured out: uh, Barry Alvarez and I sat side by side, and uh, we had a variety of people in the room. But the thing that was most differentiating was uh, the change on change of possession. The, the better teams were gaining six, seven yards per possession. And and a lot of teams that were pretty well known were losing yards. And um, and so that was one thing that we looked at. And I would guess that um, most years, you're, the, you're going to have the best two teams in the top four. And so there's a lot of clamor for going to eight or 16 teams in the playoff. and but you've got to remember this, that um, these guys are going to school and, uh, and you, don't have the, uh, you don't have the waiver wire that you have in pro football. If you lose two guys at one position, uh, you're, you're kind of out of luck. And that happened to Oregon a couple of years ago. They lost three key players in the course of the, first, uh, of the conference playoff and then the first playoff game in the and then they were out of luck in Ohio State. I think it was Ohio State beat the heck out of them. And so uh, you want to be mindful of the fact that it is a physical game. It is demanding. And, uh, and so um, I, would, I would be a little bit hard-pressed to say, well, we ought to all of a sudden go to eight games. If you go to eight or 16, I'd say the conference playoff game has is, is got to be eliminated. Uh, right now we don't we have some some conferences don't have that playoff game and so um, I think that uh, it's kind of a balancing act but I hope people will remember that there's a human factor here and how much the the body can take and uh, that's kind of kind of talked all around around the issue but uh, uh, four 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 teams is not bad but it does leave a lot of people out and they get upset but I think most of the time in that top four, you're going to end up with the best two teams in the country. I believe you for the last word. You want to make a season record prediction for wins? I'm just joking. Pressure. Um, <laughs> thank you very well, much. What you, well, okay. No, you want to, it's you my turn. To... Okay. So, Michael Zavier, thank you for joining us today. Yep. Um, as you look at this team this year and you look at the, the schedule, yep. What, what what do you predict uh, win loss record will be of the Huskers? I'm uh, I'm going with seven and five. Okay. I'm going seven and five. I mean, lose the let me go through all the games. No, that'd be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> okay, uh, and 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 you can respond yay or nay based on what he says of each of these games. I think I think they beat Colorado. Yeah. Right. Northern Illinois, Louisiana Tech, Northwestern, Purdue, Maryland, Michigan State. Take that. Take that. All right. Good bowl, good bowl game. Maybe go to Vegas, maybe. I don't know. Uh, thank you very much to Trev and Coach Osborne very much. Give it up to them, please. Thank you, guys.